How's it going guys? John the Basic Expert and I'm here with another video. We're going to be talking more about Zero E and sort of the weird intricacies within this idea of the lost D&D. This idea that the game has sort of changed and evolved for better or for worse from what it originally was in 1974 and I think this is a given and no one would deny this but I wanted to kind of focus within this video series on some of the weird things that I've discovered that I think would be surprising to modern gamers and again even to old school grognards who maybe haven't read the rules in a while or have for years played a heavily homebrewed version of the game. And I think it's very beneficial to go back and look at these design choices that were made in 1974 with the release of the game and trying to understand why they're there and the kind of game that these sorts of little weird intricacies produce that are different from what I think a lot of us expect the game to be. We're going to continue talking about characters and character creation within this idea of a lost D&D &D and uh, kind of get into some more nitty gritty about it. In the last video, we talked about there's no thief class within 1974 Dungeons and Dragons and how that's not really a problem. In this video, we're going to talk about ability scores and a few other little things, um, as well as elves and dwarves. So elves, dwarves, and hobbits actually, or halflings. So let's get into it. So one of the first things I think a lot of modern gamers will be taken aback at and maybe dislike in original Dungeons and Dragons is how human centric it is and how the rules really funnel you into being a human. Of course, you can be really anything you want. There's a whole line of saying that players should be whatever they want to be if they want to be a, a dragon they should they can be a dragon but they have to start weak and work their way up and obviously this is going to be at the discretion of the referee running the game but mechanically speaking and and rules as written wise if you if you read the rules you see you're very much sort of pushed into being um a human if you want to have the widest abilities the widest availability of things that you can be and do you know, uh, elves are capped at level four for fighting men, where and uh, level eight for magic users. Dwarves are capped at level six for fighting men, and halflings are capped at level four. And these are the only. This is like proto racist class that you would see in later versions of the game, like the basic set or the expert set or the rules cyclopedia and that whole line of of uh, basic products. Uh, human is the only one that sort of has this exponential growth where there's no cap, there's no limit. They can keep going for as long as they're gaining experience points, essentially. Uh, and these other classes are capped at uh, higher levels. Dwarves are capped at the level that they're at because them and halflings have saving throws four levels higher than what they actually are. So by the time a sixth level dwarf that's a fighting man reaches that level, they are sa making saving throws as if they are a level 10 human. So the way I see it is it's, it's sort of a give and take. There's sort of this um, strategic point that you want to try and make as uh, a player. So as a human, you are going to be able to be far more powerful in the in the long game, in the end game. You're going to be able to reach heights of power, especially as like a, a human magic user, but even as a fighting man, that uh, no dwarf or elf or halfling is going to be able to reach. But you're not going to have as good of saving throws. And if you get hit with poison, if you get hit with level drains or spells cast on you, you're not going to be able to survive it quite as readily in the early levels. And so what essentially is happening here is you are trading the ability to get a little more hardy in the early game for the the late game. You're pretty much sacrificing the late game for the early game by selecting demi-human. At least as far as elf or at least as far as dwarf and and hobbit or halfling are concerned since their saving throws are so good. The elven saving throws are not as good, but you do get elven multi-classing, which is very interesting per adventure, which is determined like per session because this is a game that assumes that you are going to be ending in town after every game session and in between each game session real time is being kept uh, one day in the real world equals one day in the game world and so it's imperative to end games in town and this links back to elves and their ability to choose per adventure what class they wish to be putting experience points into whether it's a fighting man class or the magic user class and they get the benefits of both so as long as you know they can use they can be a magic user and wear no armor but swing a sword around and, and fight like a fighting man obviously they're not going to to be as protected but they have that ability or as a fighting man you know it, it's kind of back and forth they're able to cast spells 
and essentially be like the spell sword, which you sort of see happening in, for instance, the rule cyclopedia with how it sort of uh, portrays elves in there as well. Regardless, the point I'm trying to make here is that you are sacrificing early abilities or you're, you're sacrificing the late game for powerful early abilities that are going to make you far more hardy and survivable in the wilderness and dungeon environments that your characters are going to find themselves in. And for me, this is another interesting point is when you're looking at the character classes and you're looking at the level progression, you have what is fighting capability. And I've talked about this before. I'll have the video link uh, over here that you can um, appear probably somewhere where you can watch that video where I talk about how D&D is far more heroic than you really think it is, at least old school D&D, and this is linked back to fighting capability. But you have that there, and you'll notice that uh, elves, for example, are capped at level 4 fighting men and level 8 magic users, and this is where they get the heroic fighting capability. And there's a reason for that, because elves are immune to the paralyzing touch of ghouls and other sort of undead, per the rules in Chainmail and in the rules in the three LBBs. And this is pretty interesting to me, and I think this shows that for me, this is proof that four hit die is sort of the demarcation point between, and I get into this again in the video you'll see here, the demarcation point between being a normal man and a hero. And it makes sense, it's the heroic fighting class. But heroes get special benefits, especially if you're using um, chainmail rules and you're using fighting capability. You're getting more attacks, you can fight, in, um, you can fight creatures more easily in uh, fantastical combat, you are in non-fantastical combat again you're getting multiple attacks as a level one man a level one whatever level one of your class is so you're you're getting like quite powerful and so to me it's interesting that that elves are capped at that heroic fighting capability because they've already got something that is inherent to a heroic class but they're getting it at level one what would already be at the heroic fighting capability they've already gotten at level one before they've actually achieved that so to me it makes sense that this is the you know the important heroic fighting capability or four hit die is the demarcation point between you know being a normal man and being um a, a heroic character and it's because the 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 ghoul language in the monster section of the three LBBs says that any normal figure and normal implying like normal man is paralyzed, meaning this is really cool that once you reach heroic fighting capability, you can no longer be paralyzed by ghouls. At least this is how I would interpret that rule. It seems to make the most sense to me and sort of the overarching connection between a lot of these different disparate rules, seemingly disparate, disparate rules that are, uh, over fighting capability in chainmail and uh, the rules that are expressed in the three LBBs. So, to me, pretty interesting. And how, you know, dwarves get, are capped at level six, hobbits, halflings are capped at level four. And, um, you know, they're pretty powerful with a sling if you're looking at chainmail rules, like quite powerful. And if you're looking at a clone, like, uh, which I highly recommend, uh, delving deeper, great great clone you know one of the, one of the best out there my hope is someday my clone white box would be as well regarded as delving deeper is uh you can see that the way those authors those designers have interpreted the the, the halfling they're quite powerful with slings and, and missile weapons so it kind of balances out in that way i think they get like a plus three bonus to hit or something like that something ridiculous in delving deeper i haven't looked at it recently but it's something absurd like that so there, there's this this sacrifice of the late game in order to be more survivable in the early game. However, if you're able to survive as a human towards the late game, the sky is the limit. And you also have more classes open to you. So again, like I said, we have this proto-racist class thing where halflings can only be fighting men, dwarves can only be fighting men, and um, elves can only multi-class between fighting men and uh magic users they can the only the only race that can be a cleric are humans which is super interesting to me uh, and this kind of goes in line in my opinion with um sort of the the religious imagery that is within the rules as well one other thing that is super interesting and this might really annoy uh modern players and even a few quote-unquote old school players as well who don't like this as well who might be more familiar with uh, the bx rules or or ad and d first edition or even second really anything after 
after 1974 original Dungeons and Dragons, is that it says uh, on page 10 of book one, under determination of abilities, it says prior to, to the character selection by players, it is necessary for the referee to roll three six-sided dice in order to rate each as each as to various abilities and thus aid them in scaling and selecting a role. And then it gives the, you know, the six ability scores that we are all familiar with, strength, intelligence, wisdom, constitution, dexterity, and charisma. And uh, what is interesting here, as you probably caught it, is that the referee rules these things for you. You as a player do not determine your own ability scores. Uh, much like how you couldn't determine your genetics when you were born, uh, the referee is you, the one determining your ability scores. You do not get to pick. And I, I, I find that in 0E this still works really well with ability scores. Because ability scores do not really... It's not that they don't do a whole lot. Uh, they don't do as much as they do in later versions of the game, even within the Greyhawk supplement, which put a little bit more emphasis on what your ability scores are. And by extension, started, I think, with Greyhawk, this idea of this building a character concept that I think is mostly unknown within a true 1974 3LBB plus Chainmail um, Zero E game. Because... For instance, all strength does, it does not give you a bonus to damage, it does not give you a bonus to hit. All it does, if you're a fighting man or any other class, is you can swap points two for one uh, for the purposes of XP bonus calculation. That's it. Uh, so if you have a high strength as a fighting man, you're going to level up quicker, which does mean you'll start hitting things better, but you're not going to be dealing extra damage, you're not going to be having higher probabilities of hitting with a higher strength score. Uh, Dexterity does grant you... If you have a score of 12 or more, a plus one to missile attacks uh, and a minus one to missile attacks. So if you have a 12, you get a plus one. If you have a nine or less, you have uh, a minus one. And uh, Constitution does give a bonus of plus one per hit die on your hit points uh, for a Constitution score of 15 or more. And a Constitution of six or less, uh, you get a minus one on all of your uh, hit point rolls, your hit die rolls for determining your, your hit point totals. And you can see that while these scores do affect things, it is far more gracious than, let's say, looking at even AD&D 1st Edition BX or even in modern games like 5th uh, Edition, where, you know, we have to have modifiers up to plus five and minus five or whatever it is, you know, and so... When that happens, when you have to scale more modifiers over what your ability score is, you end up having to you you end up as a player wanting to build a character. You end up wanting to have point by systems. You end up wanting to be able to roll just six numbers and to put them where you want because you want to be able to start building a character. Whereas with ODD, you're sort of given these scores and like even if you have suboptimal scores let's say you have a strength score of nine it's like okay well i have a strength score of nine i want to be a fighting man uh nine is average it's not going to be the end of the world whereas in later editions if you had a strength score of nine you're going to be looking at other scores and being like what what would be better than a fighting man at this point or a fighter maybe i want to be a mat maybe my intelligence is higher i want to be a magic user whereas you could if your intelligence was higher in OD and D, you're perfectly capable of still being a fighting man. You don't have to go the uh, the the magic user route. And even the the example character on page ten shows the player that, as an example, selecting something suboptimal because it's what they want to be, and they're not going to be necessarily punished for it as me mechanically as they would in later editions. So it says on page 10 that this character would have been better suited as a cleric, but the player has chosen to be a magic user instead, and it will still work perfectly fine. It's not going to be as traumatic or the this you're not you're not playing this gimped character like you would in later editions or even what what something like uh greyhawk would cause to happen as well which this is this brings me to this last and final point on this and then we'll, we'll close the video out here is that this is going to be something people either like or hate um i personally just view it as different and I like it. I like it as this concept of like you're rolling in your you're rolling your ability scores, or the referee gives you your ability scores, and you're sort of have what you got. You select a class and you start playing, and uh, it kind of leans more into this wargaming element, in my opinion, where you're playing more of this hero with a lot of hirelings behind you, which is the default expectation of this game. 
as charisma is very useful in, in having uh, retainers and you're giving you're given day rates in later parts of these books for uh various sorts of hirelings like footmen and whatnot of various races based on you know you could even hire orcs if you wanted to uh but for like dwarves elves and then generally humans are the most prevalent sort of hireling that you can find as far as um npc followers i i rather like it i just view it as different it's just as different way of playing and i haven't found that it sort of uh, affects immersion in the game um it doesn't affect tactics as much and it really frees up players to really play the kind of character they want to play in my opinion rather than being so dependent on and worried about the mechanics of the game the the ability scores perform the bare minimum and that worst, it's like, okay, I'm not going to level up as quickly, but I really want to play a magic user this game. And so I'm okay with not leveling up as quickly as a magic user. I'd level up quicker as a cleric, but, you know, the party needs a magic user, maybe. Maybe the party's like, we need someone who can cast sleep at level one, you know. Uh, we already have a cleric, and this person's already better suited to be a cleric, so we would love it if you were a magic user, <laughs> you know, for the party, so that maybe we have a uh, someone who's able to cast spells from the back there. And... You know, I, I think that that's cool. It, it creates a situation where players are able to be what they want and they're not so beholden to this build a character concept that would get out of control in, in third edition and 3.5 and to some degree is a problem in, um, in, in fifth edition still. And I know I said it'd be the one final thing, but one other thing I'd like to talk about, and this kind of harkens back to the previous video with the lack of thieves and the lack of stealth abilities but there's still other mechanics that can be used, is that I really truly appreciate that this is totally a class-based game. I think that, in my opinion, the addition of skills on top of a level-based system is a mistake. And I think that it creates this too much bloat mechanically within the game, and therefore it, it causes a, a lot of problems. And I think that 0E, just not having skills at all and having that dialogue with your referee. And again, you know, like I talked about in the last video, you can use mechanics already inherent in the game in order to determine if uh, a character wants to do something or not. If you want to leave it up to the chance of the dice, it's not impossible to look at the rules. And again, like I said in the last video, you surprise in order to determine if someone is stealthy or not. And um, it's not impossible to, to apply, you know, a modifier to a reaction role for someone with a high charisma score, for example. Um, so th those are just things to consider. And I think it ultimately works better for 0E that it doesn't have skills um, as opposed to something modern like 5th edition or this new edition of 5E that's coming out where uh, there are skills and I, I just think it kind of muddies the water and leads to this idea of building a character which is just wholly absent from 0E and it's a very refreshing take on, on the genre and on the game in my opinion. I think especially if you come from a more modern mindset uh, it might be a little scary. It might be a little you like, I don't know if I like this but ultimately I think once you get into the groove of it um, the, the simplicity and yet it's simple yet com complexity of zero E, uh, definitely scratches every itch that you could want in a game, in my opinion. Uh, so I, I think that I, I just appreciate that it's just a level based game. There's no skills. The ability scores do, they, they do enough to make them matter and want to roll them, but they're not so much that, uh, it bogs down the game in this character creation game. Um, so that does it for this video, guys. I hope that you found this interesting, that ability scores don't really do a whole lot. They do enough. And that um, this is a very human-centric game. Uh, you can be a demi-human, but you are sacrificing the late game for the surviving in the early game. And these are all different, like, unique things that I think are just solely lacking, completely lacking in a lot of modern games. And, and some of these things are even removed from clones or reinterpretations of old rules. And I think that's more to the detriment of the experience of the game rather than, than an improvement in my opinion. But that's just my opinion. Tell me what you think in the comments. Like, subscribe, share the video. If you want to support my channel, you can do so here on, on YouTube. Although I prefer if you did it on my Gilded server or on Subscribestar. Links to all that will be in the video description below. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Peace out.